like to say a massive welcome to Kumu Michelle Manu and the Art of Lua. So it's really great to have you here. And the Art of Lua is an art that I only learned about recently, actually, from your interview of Sensei Emmet. I was super excited to kind of see an art that clearly has so much heritage and culture still within its roots and also so connected to the land, but also someone who's clearly so passionate about it, that's been on a journey with it and is still on a journey with it. So if you could, for our viewers that haven't heard of the art or don't know you, Michelle, could you give us a little introduction about you and the art of Lua? Uh, sure. Thank you for having me first. Um, so like you said, it's a, it's an ongoing journey, I think, with all of us that are lifers. You know, um, there's so much to learn and so many layers to peel back. Uh, I started training martial arts when I was nine years old, and um, I ended up finding my teacher, Olohe Solomon Kaivalu, um, in the late 90s and well, mid nineties and um, became, I didn't know it, but at that moment I became a disciple. I didn't know that it would completely ensnare me um, and carve my path. And so part of the path has been uh, in 2009, I was able to start teaching and that is a huge um, gift. It's not something that you just get when you turn black belt or fifth degree. It's, um, you know, a, a huge responsibility. And so, uh, starting at nine, different arts. So you've got, you know, the American Kempo and, and some of the Korean arts uh, for conditioning specifically. And then you've got the Japanese arts that I, I had just had a little taste of. And when I found Olohe and he accepted me as a student, it, everything changed. I got to see how my hula, which I started when I was three, actually is the same movements as the lua. Uh, because it was concealed and it becomes very evident. Uh, the movements that we do to tell the story is now actually used in combat. So it's my belief that the system is pretty much the same energy on the spectrum. Okay, and so it's the same energy. You've got um, the storytelling, the olelo, the, uh, the, the, the energy of the hula, very flowy. And um, then you've got the center where it's lomi lomi and it's the, the, the the massage and then the lua lumi which is for the massage for the warriors that were on the battlefield before during and after for healing then you scope all the way to the other end of the energy spectrum and there lies lua um so no contact contact with intent to heal and restore and then this uh, all the way on the other end would be to dislocate um so that's that's uh, the realm to be, I think, a full warrior would be to learn all of them uh, and to see how that energy flows and how to change your intent. It's like, um, you know, the feminine energy, right? The coiled and potential. Energy. So um, that is my journey is to learn all of those so that I can become a whole warrior and balanced in both energies and everything in between. Mm -mm -mm. Fascinating. So the hula has really given you sort of a different maybe perspective on coming into it and going into Lua and having that already in your movement, a way of moving and being, and then going into more and more martial art orientated way of perspective of it as well and kind of finding more of a balance with, with these two. Yes, it's, it's um, helped me. I, I think it wasn't until I was asked to do a uh, to contribute to a research paper for the University of Hawaii where they asked me really what what Lua movements are really concealed in the hula and at that moment I was it's so interesting you know how these things come up and it makes you examine it makes you actually sit in it you can feel the energy when you're moving but it's so different than when it's intellectual right so we've got you know the mind the body and the spirit we, that's such a cliche right we hear people talk about that all the time but you really don't know how to bridge them and, and put them all together and so being able to move in those movements, I knew them, like I, I was about that, I became that, but to really then have to get the mind involved, which is usually the opposite <laughs> process, right? First, we think about, then we know about, uh, then we know, and then we become it. And so it was kind of opposite in that way where I was like, oh my gosh, really the hella is, which is a, a kane or a bottom half of the, the, the body movement in hula actually is 
the pua, the pig, and, and part of our stomping and kicking. So it really, uh, and so many other movements that really just became super evident um, as I moved in them and as I put my, the pen to paper of thinking of all of this, it was really quite transformational. And is that, is that hula as well? Is that giving you more of a connection with the ground and connection to the land within the movement and taking that sort of idea into the Lua side of it as well? Uh, yes, and uh, it's about connection and the flow. And uh, it is really about uh, connecting, not just with yourself, but the elementals that are around you. And that includes, um, you know, Haumea, Mother Earth. And all of the elementals, you know, there's a lot of deep in the Hawaiian culture. And um, some will argue they were actually human individuals. Uh, and some will argue they were strictly elementals, these gods that were assigned to these elementals. Um, so it's connecting with those too, the, the wind and the air and the water, fresh and salt, um, mountain energies, um, and those guardians of those properties. And so hula helps with that, especially when you are, um, grounded and you're in the soil you're in the sand uh it's it, in the water it's from i mean the, the energy changes from when your feet are in the water to when you're up to your knees to when you're so you know up to your waist and that was the there was a whole separate squadron from what i understand of koa or lua warriors that were seafaring warriors so talk about the differences in weaponry and um they're attuned to different things me oh, Battles happened at night following the stars. So there's a lot of, of that we're still learning about, you know. Mm. Yeah, the, the, clearly the heritage, the land is just packed within. Yeah, and when I watch you move, even in your videos, I can see it in your movement. And I'll, I can also see the power, the power in your movements, but also the gracefulness and the yeah did the gracefulness do you think that comes more from maybe your own personality or is the dance what the dance helped with that well i um thank you <laughs> really you know there's those that go to the gym and they're about physique and what you look like. And I think it's, um, for me, my goal has always been about power and the physique actually reflects that training. And so um, it's probably part of my personality too. <laughs> I, I, you know, as I become more and more what I feel advanced and proficient and learning more things. And as I evolve, because I have evolved even since my, my teacher has, has left us, um, which was July of 2019. Um, you know, the straight takedowns where we lock and we kick the throat with the back of the heel and with our knee and the shoulder blade to lock. Now that has actually become something even more uh, deadly for me where I no longer, I, it, their head actually goes into the middle of my legs and I get to sieve that and then drive them down into the pit, you know, lua meaning pit, bury your waist in deep dark pit behind the house. Um, so yeah, it's been an evolution. I can, I continue to be unapologetic. I, I've seen, maybe it's my age, you know, as we age, we seem to be, uh, not really care what others think and to be true to our evolution. But I think the more that I advance, the more that I teach, the more that I see these principles, um, even change in my students and those that I am so grateful to be have our paths cross, that it is truly um, an evolution and these, these movements work and they're healing. I always say movement is, is medicine. You know, don't pop the pill start moving, start moving that energy. If you're, if you're angry or confused, something a little more challenging, like a, you know, sprints for a period of time, really heavy body weight exercises, maybe just, you know, smack the crap out of Bob or a flex bag or a heavy bag. You know, when we're in between and everything's kind of upbeat and feel good, we have clarity. There's really nothing that's bothering us consciously or subconsciously. Then, um, you know, maybe like a light jog or a fun workout. And then when we're contemplative and we're sorting things out, you know, maybe a goddess or a god walk, um, maybe some yoga or stretching, something that's restorative that matches where we are spiritually and mentally. And so um, I really think that movement is medicine and I try you know, we all have our ups and downs and we all have things that enter our lives. And I think it really 
if we're, we have all that pent up when something does happen, then we're going to release all of that because we have no control. So being more in tune with who we are at every turn, I think makes us whole warriors. And that was part of the warrior culture of the people of Hawaii. Fascinating. So it's really what you're teaching and doing is alive. So it's constantly changing and evolving with the necessity of how you're feeling in the moment. And that's how you're teaching it and learning from seeing your students and giving them what they need at the time and using the art that has the heritage behind it to as a tool, basically. Mm. It's really, it's, it's super cool. <laughs> no, it's super cool. Thank you. And you're, so you're quite well versed, obviously, in martial arts, in dance, and you've tried a lot of martial arts, and you're also doing other things as well, aren't you? I've, I've seen on your Instagram, you're actually helping train some actors for their roles. Yes, sorry, I think I have a little delay, I apologize um, if I seem like I'm not paying attention, but I am, it's like freezing, it's, you know, technology. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I, others would, uh, other practitioners and Kumu would say, you know, you keep it secret, it's, it's, it's a cultural practice, and I understand that 100%, but at the same time, I, my life has really developed to that knowingness of that I'm um, one of those that will perpetuate it, and with that, I'm, um, out there. I get contacted to help um, bring in the Lua and the Hula and those movements into media. And so um, one, one very uh, exciting project coming up very soon is our culture where um, I will get to use the Lua in a way that I, I would never want to use it. And that is to choreograph very real domestic violence scenes. This would be the toxic Lua, if you will, the, the Lua that we that would be used in a sense um, to harm, not just defend. And you know, as part of the Lua, once you know, there's this this concept of Anu I, not Aloha, turn the other cheek and be happy all the time. Anu I is uh, more of the ancient Maori concept of reflection. If you come with me in bad intentions, then that's what I'm going to reflect to you. As soon as I think you're going to hit me and you don't even make contact, it switches and now I'm on offense. So bringing that uh, brutal dislocation um, locks uh, really uh, efficient movements to the screen is, is probably going to be quite emotional for me. We're gonna have um, a psychologist on set for everyone. But then I also get to use it in the good way where then I was asked to be on camera. So I'll actually be playing and starring in the role of Leilani, which will then be the self-dispense instructor within the movie. So I get to show both sides of um, the Lua there. And all these projects are just another way for me to share with the world um, you know, this, this beautiful art and how devastating it can be. Just because Lua, and it never will, have a brick and mortar and be known so well as other arts doesn't mean it's not a viable and formidable art. And I think it's important as well to show the different aspects, the different perspectives of an art to really get an understanding of it anyway, because fundamentally any martial art keeps you grounded in the sense of even though there's many aspects to it, mind, body, and spirit, there's still a fundamental drive to protect yourself if you need to on a simple level. And it has to have that for it to be a martial art at the end of the day. And it's important to show them different aspects. And, at the, and also you're empowering people to know that if they are in that situation, they can defend themselves. So really looking forward to seeing that and seeing you star in that and seeing how that all comes together thank you so much I, I i had an hour phone call with the director and and she's also made it mandatory uh, the production for all cast and crew to go through a, a basic training mm -hmm. so what an honor for me to be able to impact others off off camera you know so i i'm hoping that people see these movements and say oh my god what art is that who is she what art is that and, and bring more awareness to the devastating art. You know, where the culture isn't just about plastic lays and, uh, you know, aloha and pina coladas. It's actually very rich, yeah. Yeah, like, like I said before at the beginning, actually, because I hadn't heard of the art, I hadn't seen it before, 
straight away I was like wow how have I not heard of this you know it's, it's fascinating to know that there are arts out there that haven't had that exposure that clearly deserve to but also basically need people like you <laughs> to get out there and share it because otherwise these arts don't get passed on they don't get shared with people and at the end of the day any martial art is really there to be of service to people and if you're not sharing it then you're not serving people so yeah it's really great to kind of understand and see these different methods and ways you're reaching people because there's many avenues to reach people and it's not always the one simple way that you can reach someone like for me if I never saw Bruce Lee moving as a kid I would have never got into martial arts you know and seeing these sort of things is the kind of things that first grabs your attention and connects with you in a different way and then draws you into it Absolutely. And um, I, actually, I get I'm really excited. I get to breach beyond just the martial community next month. Um, and, and I'm with uh, Shannon Lee, speaking of Bruce Lee. It's pretty remarkable, especially during next month here uh, in the US. You know, it's um, Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And to be able to powerfully represent that, I mean, is, uh, and especially as a woman, um, it's pretty remarkable. I'm honored to do so. So oh, cool. And you are the first woman to receive the coolest title ever. Well, which one is that? <laughs> the Knight Commander of the yes. Royal Order of yes. Kamehameha. Yes, correct. And uh, I actually thought that was a joke. I got a call and uh, <laughs> they said, you know, <laughs> You, uh, we, we're, we'd like to give you this designation to recognize you for the work you're doing to promote the Hawaiian culture, specifically the Lua. And uh, I said, what are you talking about? This, the only men are allowed to be members. Why in the world would you unite a woman? And so, I, you know, that designation is also for uh, the prime minister of Japan. Um, so we've got other uh, treaties, if you will, that uh, the Royal Order of Kamehameha the first is, has um, honored. And it's just pretty remarkable to be part of that, um, very unexpected. And uh, I really did think it was a joke. So yeah, Dame, uh, Knight Commander for the work. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, being a Kumu um, of the Kaivalu lineage, it, that was important. It still is very much. But when I was given that designation, it elevated to all of the people of Hawaii and the culture. And I think that I really hold dear. And I'm reminded of that every moment that I'm representing the culture as a whole and I try to do that as best I can. Mm -hmm. I can see that by stepping up and being given these titles that obviously you've not just titles but positions that you're in where you can share so much with people is working both ways for you basically. You're by you putting it forward your service you're also receiving what you deserve as well basically. I don't even see it that way. Um, I just what an honor to be in this place, Luca, to be able to powerfully represent. And also, you know, on the woman front, um, the culture not having uh, really much representation as a female uh, for, from female warriors in like 200 years. So it's it's pretty remarkable place to be uh, here in, in my lifetime. And you're also teaching online. Yes, yeah, so I'm teaching regularly online. Um, it started with COVID and it will continue even after COVID. Um, most of my students I haven't even met in person. So we have Australia and uh, parts of Hawaii, different islands of Hawaii and then all over the states. And there's regular inquiries um, from, from Europe um, and parts of Asia. You know, none of them have really signed up just yet. The time zone makes it a little bit difficult, um, but I do have an online classroom. There is some historical information on there. And, you know, learning these movements and their, the, their titles and names, um, it's a, it literally is a different language. So I really don't harp on that, um, you know, at the beginning. The more you hear it, the more you become 
aware of them and you start to learn them. And so there's eight different warrior levels uh, up to black belt. And then of course continues after that, as you know, black belt is only really the foundational aspect. Then we start really getting into the Mayakawa and the weaponry. And I think, you know, it's been really good even without having partners and being remote. I think it's given everyone a time to reconnect with their body or connect with their body for the first time. Namely, the, the women students, they train separately from the Kane, the men, for right now. And they are learning to embrace that energy that they may have been victimized by in their past and learning how to harness that, be comfortable, and then use it. So it's been a really beautiful process to watch the evolution of, of my students. And I, they're so amazing. I don't know how they found me. I don't know why they stay with me. I just am uh, so grateful to log on and be with them uh, when, you know, during all of our classes. And I hold quite a few privates as well. Um, and those are action packed also. Um, but it's not all hula and lua and metaphysical. We actually, I use all sorts of music to show that hula and movement can be done with any type of music, except for like death rap and really slow country right um but yeah i mean you can really hula to anything that has an eight count uh to get your you know get flowing um and i use different warm-ups for our wellness portion just to get our you know a stretch and move so we do like favorite dances of the 80s capoeira um uh, thor wow. workout uh you know hip-hop you you name it our our opening for the first 20 minutes is really quite intense and then we go when i've got everyone's attention and all the distractions of the mind are now back in the body because these are challenging movements then they're mine and then we move straight into hula and lua sometimes you know alternating and then we go into the metaphysical portion of you know evaluating ourselves where are we um, having, uh, you know, uh, constructive criticism, constructive conversations, collaborative conversations, um, how to deal with ourselves and give us some room. If we don't have anyone or that can understand what we might be going through, how do we hold space for ourselves? You know, how do we understand what we're going through and how we don't allow that to bleed and seep out into everything else that we do. So, you know, it's about becoming whole and I've really, it seems impossible through Zoom, but I have had tremendous success in my opinion, and I continue to um, make these classes available. It's really wonderful. <laughs> and if people want to find you, find these classes, where's the best place for them to reach you and find out about this? Oh, so we have, um, there's uh, Thinkific is the website for, well, for the classroom. So it's not COA. Um, the specific nonprofit is uh, N A New Word K O A Inc., and that is been um, that has been uh, formed for the sole perpetuation of the Hawaiian Lua. Um, so the classroom is N A K O A dot Thinkific dot com, and so all class uh, videos have been uploaded there, and you can go back and self study. That's a good place, and also michellemanu.com. That's a good place to go ahead and send a message, and I will reply by email. Um, so I was sort of like how you found me, Luca. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put links to all of that in the description. Thank you, Luca. So would you like to see some weaponry or? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, hold on one second. I'll get my bag. Okay, Luca, we'll go through a crash course of the different <laughs> weaponry here. Good. Some of these are um, specifically Kaivalu. So what I didn't explain is there are many practitioners. Some are very secret, uh, different ones on different islands. They all had their own fighting style. Um, and some we don't even know of today. There's those that stay secret. Um, and then there's those that are kind of out there. Um, very few like me, I've really blown it up. Uh, so, but, you know, again, in, in, in perpetuating the Lua. So um, some of these, I'll tell you which one is uh, absolutely just Kaivalu uh, lineage. So first we have the Ho'e, which is just the paddle. All of these for different koa or warrior would be um, sized for that specific koa, a size, a height, weight, and also circumference of of our hold. So this is made for me. Anytime we hold a weapon, we want to make sure we can still make our fist. We can still punch um, anything while we're holding. So we're not making exceptions for the weapon. If Kaivalu sees this, we go for the finger. <laughs> we don't go for the weapon. And you'll see that. So this is a beautiful weapon. It's usually about six feet, of course, based on the size and height of the warrior. 
Some of the basic strikes here would be just the regular paddle, right? But when we paddle, obviously the, the front end will come down. So we can hit, hit someone in front of us. If someone's behind us, we can also uh, spear behind us. We've got the sweep, the sweeping like we would sweep. This sweep is this move. So we are going to, so it's coming up. Obviously when we do this, we can come back down to a paddle and get ready and knowing where your blade is, vertical, horizontal, this will hurt more. So things like that. There's also, you know, on the battlefield, you're exposed and there's so many around. So this would be used obviously to cover the spine in case anything would want to be coming from behind. Spear coming straight down, using the back end to uh, trap and, and bust the throat and the face coming back down again and hitting. So this is used in many different ways, obviously um, for our seafaring mostly. Say there's warriors that submerge out of the water towards the canoe, the wa'a, there's the skimming of the water, which you can hit here. So, you know, always being able to adjust. So you're on the canoe and this would hit any heads coming up. This one is, is Kaibalu. This is a double-edged dagger with a ko'o ko'o, so like a short bow, shorter than our short bow. And this is used just like a short bow. Maka means eyes, but Kaivalu, he would use it for any hole. So, you know, we're talking about the pico or anywhere else, the ala ala. <laughs> so yeah, and this, so this is a really beautiful weapon. So same spearing. Notice we don't jab. It's really this type of plain pool type of spearing. Okay. This is also for the locking of the wrist and then coming back up to the eyes. The shorter version of the makapahoa ko'o is a makapahoa, much more um, durable here for, um, you know, fighting. So this comes also with a cord, not necessarily used for strangulation, more so to be, so you don't lose your weapon on the battlefield. But if a warrior did, then one would have to be proficient in hand-to-hand. -hand. This is used to slam. This is used to trap. This is used to trap. This is not just here. We come all the way up and there's a turning to it so you can lock it and you create the arm to go in a certain way. What I found, anything with a cord, you can also turn into a projectile to try to keep someone out of your space. There's nine and three to create the shield, much like Dr. Strange, right? <laughs> and then there's uh, the, the, the 12 and six, and then there's the figure eight. So if you were to see this here, getting this nice and tight, and it just becomes part of your body, right? And so if we would do the figure eight, that would keep someone away here, two, nine, and three. Dr. Strange move, okay? And being able to bring it back up and get ready. So this would hit, this would jab, this would come up. There's the takedown. But the key to this is not just stabbing. Mm -hmm. It's to find the cheekbones. And as you do this, you don't even have to look. You feel it dives into the eye sockets and then into the floor. So you want to go as far as you can. Okay. This is the ku A. What you'll see with others is there's no pahi, there's no knife here. You'll see this knuckle duster, they call it. Same, always being able to punch, right? So the shark teeth would be facing east and west. So you, don't, you can't slice one way. You'd be able to slice both. You don't wanna hit with the shark teeth. You wanna hit and then slice. Also, there's the gangster way, right? I'm holding it <laughs> so that you, uh, you know, you can't really see it. So there's this and being able to flip and use it this way. Even just this much wood, you're able to lock someone in a figure four behind and take them down. So this is the kueku e. This is uh, it, straight from Kaivalu, a little bit different. The pahoa, so you saw the double-edged dagger. This is the single-edged dagger. Very devastating. Um, Captain Cook of England wrote about how throughout his entire travels, 
throughout the South Pacific, this was only indigenous to Hawaii. So everyone else had different types of neba or clubs, but this was only from the Hawaiian people and pretty devastating the way some of the warriors wielded it. So you can see again, we have the strangulation cord. This is used for strangulation. Well, this goes into the spine. So around the neck, grab, and the person's on the ground, this goes into the spine and this, while well, this is rowing, pulling back. So again, this can also be used. We wanna hit, shoot past the eye. We wanna shoot through, um, we wanna shoot down here. So finishing that. Um, and again, same, busting, trapping, hitting, stabbing, and shooting. Um, so, and this is usually a lot sharper. So you can see it's dulled down slightly, still hurts. I've, I've, I've been able to wrap a lot of t-shirts <laughs> going through the ribs in practice. So this also, again, same thing, knowing the weight of your weapon and being able to wield it again. Same thing. The, I think one of the last ones I'd like to show you, the pololu is 20 feet long with a pointed uh, dagger. It's used as a javelin. That was the first line of defense for all of the warriors that would encase visitors that they weren't supposed to be there. This doesn't look like much, but this is a ka'aning. The actual word means strangulation. So it is applied to all of our empty handed techniques too for strangulation. This is pretty remarkable. Um, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna move, use it as a projectile too, because you'll hear the whistling of the wood through the, through the air. So we don't actually hold this. This just elongates our, our fists. And this takes some time getting used to. Still being able to punch, but this is what ex extends our fist. And so from here, this is where we would, you know, punch, wrap, and then take down. So everything in the elbows, the, the hawk, if you will, the eel, will be uh, being able to push down and you drive at the same time. This as a, like a poi ball um, in entertainment. You hear that? Oh, yeah. So I don't think <laughs> anyone is gonna wanna come in on that. <laughs> and Michelle, is that something that I can see from all the other ones that they're tools that you're gonna have with you in your surroundings, in your land. Is that one you'd have wrapped around you or something yes. like that? Yes, and even um, the same principles of this could be used for a sarong as well. So okay. around our neck to carry water, to carry anything uh -huh. to bundle, and then also around our waist. So there's many different ways to conceal this. And this is what I travel with on the plane. <laughs> so yeah, I love this weapon very much. <laughs> Oh, love that again. A lot of ideas. Love it. And then you know, I think I'll show. Um, there's other paddles too. Different weight distribution, right? This yeah. is a little bit of a shorter one. Picture about 100, 70, 76 to 100 shark teeth around here. Oh as wow, well. wow! And so, I'm um, sorry. Where, where did they get the shark teeth? Do they get them, pick them up um, off land once they've washed ashore? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, and also, um, you know, um, the sharks that Manu who at Make they died. Um, Manu is considered one of the Amakua or family gods and sacred uh, within the Hawaiian waters. Um, so there's a meaning to everything in the culture. Mm -hmm. The sighting of a honu, a turtle, the sighting of an, an eel, a hawk, uh, even a gecko, the mo'o, um, the lizard, you know, they're all of these, uh, the owl, you name it, there was always very, a uh, very deep meaning for the individual that was presented with nature. Um, so yeah, they would, they would go ahead and get the mono teeth. Uh, they would never harm the shark, but if they could find some somehow, um, that's, that's what they would use. It's kind of like the feathers, right, of a bird, the manu, manu catcher. Um, different families were, there were, there were feather men and women, and they were only allowed to take so many feathers off a bird. They could not kill the bird. So working in cooperation with nature instead of demolishing it and decimating it, very important. Um, the last weapon I think I'd like to show you today is just the short bow, the ko'o ko. We also have a cane, but um, the same principles here. So kind of like the makapahoa ko'o ko'o. This is, this is such a powerful weapon here. We use it obviously, you know, different blocks. You know, we've got the baseball swing to the head, to the ankles, all the way around. Okay? Here being able to, to spear 
Then there's that sweep again, or the paddle. Here is our sweep. There's so many different movements here that are, are so beautiful. Um, and again, you know, we are not just hitting and our hands are stationary. We're sliding and making friends and knowing our weapon. So that baseball swing, right? <laughs> Being able to cover the spine and come back and get ready. Uh, we're not standing straight up. Everything is very rooted and very grounded. We're drawing energy from Haumea, Mother Earth is coming through and we're exerting that. And it's up to us to decide, are we just tapping for a setup? Are we going all the way through, hitting to a tree that we see or through a wall and going through our opponent? Um, so uh, that is, that's what takes time <laughs> and what we uh, learn and how to learn how to use our mana, our power. Thank you for letting me share all the weaponry. <laughs> So so cool, <laughs> so cool. Uh, what was the one called again with the like the knuckle duster one with the oh, shark? Yeah, <laughs> this is the kuekue. Ku okay. And you know, I I I have pictures of it. Um, I don't I don't let them leave my house. The ones with the actual shark teeth. Mm -hmm. Um, but this is a trainer. So, you know, again, built for the warrior's hand size. So very dangerous. A lot of the poking and you know coming around. Uh, there's a lot of this going on. Yeah, so, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, how, just out of interest, how do you attach the teeth into it? Okay, so ancient, they would peg it. Um, today we see a lot of, um, you know, shark teeth are very expensive today, um, but rather than killing sharks, you know, there's some really um, beautiful uh, um, synthetic teeth. I don't know if, unless you've worked with uh, authentic shark teeth, once you start to drill in it, it's a very costly mistake if it shatters. It's like drilling one of our teeth, right? Mm -hmm. So there's pegs and there's also lacing. Um, and others, they use glue today because um, we're not going to use these, you know, in in real life unless it's on my wall and someone breaks into my house, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, they're about 15 to $25 a piece. So it's pretty expensive for the shark teeth. So you can imagine how much um, even just, you know, even just our regular hoe, how much that would cost. And so when people write for weapons to be made and they say, oh my God, it's how much? Well, it's really the cost of the items that we're, we're putting onto the, with the wood also, and not merely the time. It takes a lot of time and care and prayer. You know, I think that goes back to everything in the culture. You hear the word sacred a lot. Um, this is sacred, this place is sacred, that person is sacred, this work is sacred. And you know, it all goes back to uh, the metaphysical principle of intention. When we spend time, hours and hours, even when we're picking out the wood, when there is an order, it's something you just know, this is for this individual, you buy the wood. As you're, as you're working on the weapon and putting it together, you're in prayer, not to some you know, deity, but to the allness, divinity saying, bless this weapon, Bless the owner of this weapon. May this weapon have a long life. May the owner have a long life. You know, may this weapon serve the owner in the way that you intend it to serve the owner. And so that in itself, the process, I believe, makes something sacred. That intention is then placed into the wood. It's then blessed on both the wood as well as um, the individual that will be owning it. And, you know, Meakawa were very important. Um, they didn't have a whole array of this. They didn't necessarily master all of this. I mean, the belief is that each warrior had their favorite weapon. That weapon was named. That weapon had a place in the house where it slept on a pillow that wasn't awakened until its owner, no one else touched it, until its owner needed it for practice or for warfare. So wow. this weapon was very much uh, regarded. As, as an individual, much like how we should look at our body, right? Um, a, a loved one that can't really care for itself. And so we must show it kindness and consideration. It's the same with the weaponry. So deeper meaning to everything where, I don't know about you there in the UK, but the Americans, we have these checky lists and check everything off and you move on and nothing really is sacred in any percentage. So when we do dive into the meaning of creating, and the meaning of intention and uh, well wishes for others and prayer for that. It really does change who we are. Um, we have more respect for life, all living things, our connectivity to all of those things. And that also then is showed in our practice, even though we're learning these very uncomfortable and deadly moves. 
Um, not everyone is filled with intention out there that is good. They are filled with intention that is not so good. And we need to be prepared for that. Mm. Yeah, I think I think the UK is quite similar with so much consumption of everything and everything moving at such a fast pace. Yeah. That what you're offering and doing with people and the time you're spending with them and showing them that other side uh, to things is, I think people are starting to connect with that more and more. And martial arts is something that actually allows people to do that. Um, pretty a source that people, they're not finding it from, you know, just the general sort of external bombardment of everything that's always coming in all the time. I think maybe we're getting sick and tired of just going with the flow. I think we're, some of us are really ready to rock the boat in a respectful way. I think, um, We've tried everything that they that whoever may say will give us fulfillment and we're still not fulfilled. We're still starving. We're still bankrupt in some areas. And I think now we're starting to look for more of the depth of how remarkable we are as human beings, um, regardless of where we live and what culture we are from in this lifetime. Um, and I think that is what the draw is. Um, equality for ourselves, not just our world around us, right? I mean, what am I here to do? Uh, and unless I find partially one of my purposes, if, if it's not one sole purpose, until I find those and start developing in that area, I, maybe I will ne never feel fulfilled. So, you know, we're, we're bombarded with, you know, celebrities, we're, we're bombarded with all these products and services and the gimmick of the day and, 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 and what you should do this month. And there's a lot of uh, lip service about, you know, blah, 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 blah. And some of it's helpful, some of it's not. And it's up to us to use our inner man and inner woman to guide us in those things, but we must listen. The more we suppress that, more we cannot hear. And I think as we move and we study these sacred principles um, that are really not, not solely to one culture, they run deep in all. And once we can identify those and what speaks to us, what resonates with us may not resonate with someone else because that's part of our path. It's part of our journey. So. We're not supposed to look like anyone else. We're supposed to be us, who we are. You do you, I do me. And hopefully we can come together and collaborate and work with one another well and uh, try to understand, you know, instead of judging. I think, I think most of us are done with the judging. I mean, let's just take the vaccination right now. You know, there's those that are, oh my God, I'm getting vaccinated. And there's those that have gotten vaccinated and they're asking, have you gotten vaccinated? And you say, um, not yet, I'm not really sure. And they say, wonderful. It's, it's your decision. And then there's those that refuse to get vaccinated, right? So you've got the, the one camp hating this camp and this camp hating that camp. And in the middle, they're kind of like, well, we're okay. Do what's right. So that's just a, a real life today example of, you know, the black and white living versus the gray living and allowing others to have the same grace um, that we give to ourselves. But if we don't give that to ourselves, we won't have it for others. So, you know, that whether the mode is Lua, Kula, metaphysical, yoga, whatever it may be, uh, we need to find our way and embrace that uh, and accept where we are and accept where we want to go and be willing, be in that state of consciousness, of willingness to even try something. So that's what I hope that some of my students are getting like, oh my gosh, I never even thought about what organs are affected in the fall. It's like, organs are affected in the fall. There are supplements that can help me. There are foods that can increase my immunity during the change of weather. This is an astrology. We're talking real life. We're energy and the world we live in is energy and um, we're affected by everything, whether we think so or not. So being made aware that there's, you know, what does peace mean to you, Luca? When you answer like, well, if all of my loved ones are okay, then, oh my gosh, we've got a codependent issue here. Because mm -hmm. guess what? Not everyone is going to be okay. So uh, we have to still maintain that center and that, that peace, even though it's turbulent. I call it the Richter scale, right? Like an earthquake. We still need to kind of have control of ourselves and our emotions so that we don't get dragged away in the tide every time there's a change in our society. So determining if the energetic dis just disruption is within ourselves, our own energetic body, our surrounding energetic body with all those that are around us, planetary and then divine. So determining which where the disruption is helps us really get through that because I have a niece that's like, what's wrong with me? 
I, I feel this. Well, maybe it's not even you. <laughs> so to determine, you know, is it me or is it the, you know, outside of myself is also very helpful. So these are principles we're not taught. We're not uh, shown that we're energy. We're shown we're just tangible things, but everything manifests. So it's definitely in metaphysical, spiritual, energetic before it becomes visual and something that we can touch. So, you know, our thoughts are so very important. They create things, their energy. So, you know, watching ourselves, did we insert, did we consciously start that thought or was that implanted and now we're, we're nurturing it and it's growing and it's actually not very, it's not beneficial for us. So, you know, I'm sorry to go on and on. So you can see there's just a lot to becoming whole and you're absolutely right. Martial arts training is essential in my opinion. I don't see any other way for my life. Yeah, similar for me as well. It's, it allows you to kind of get the awareness to be able to make the decision or make the changes. But if you're just in amongst sort of the general, like we're saying bombardment and amongst the general screaming and shouting that's always going on this side that side blah 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 you don't really get a chance to actually think for yourself or get in touch with yourself or connect with yourself and yeah martial arts is definitely an avenue that makes you at first at least become aware that you are your own person basically and you can connect with yourself and then move from there instead of just getting pulled this way and that way and all over the place Agree, a hundred percent. Thank you. You should have cut me off. I, I talk too much. <laughs> oh. it's, it's interesting because I think overall, you can see the depth that you've on your journey so far have got from your training and it comes through in everything you're doing, how you move, how you're saying, even just with the weaponry. And one of the things I was going to say before about your strength in your movements, it's more from, I can see that it's more from your intention and knowing yourself and just the intention behind like I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it and that's a different sort of strength than having to try and force something or muscular sort of like strength to try and get something done it's just you knowing where you'll be where you want to be and doing it basically <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I, I don't watch myself except for on class uh, videos, but I'm looking for technique, right? I'm not looking for my overall general being. Thank you for the compliment. That really means a lot. Oh, thank you. Can, you're, you're welcome, Michelle. And just really looking forward to seeing how this, how this movie comes out. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to need counseling myself after choreographing the, the terrible domestic violence scenes, but it's going to be a, a you know a new experience for me to use the lua in a different way so thank you i know there's a huge announcement next week um i can't believe it but there's an a star a, a list star that has been casted so i'll be sharing the screen with her and i i'm uh, it's a bit surreal so you know we, we, some of us aren't actors we just we just love what we do right and if there's a way to share that um why not you think of we're back to full circle bruce lee you know 15 students in his his basement while he was upstairs with his best friend you know adding you know different things to his art and then going to media and and look what that did for him he was able to really impact the world and he still does um through movies so i'm hoping to have that not be a bruce but have just a little bit of percentage of being able to say you know what yeah actually I know what lua is it's it's not just a luau right where they get together eat pork and see you know beautiful hula dancers it's actually the the ancient only indigenous native warrior art to the people of Hawaii so very important distinction and maybe one day when people say lua they won't think of um of uh, software <laughs> or uh, you know the party, they'll they'll actually know that that was a a very deep and rich uh, warrior art cultural practice. Mm, and I think in general for martial arts, lua is something that all not just martial artists but martial artists as well need to see the art that has so much heritage and culture still within it because a lot of martial arts do kind of evolve over time and a lot does get lost as well so there's always kind of being able to stay connected to what you're doing is still important and knowing it yourself does give you an element of grounding and it's really clear that Lewis still kind of got that in it and it's still being able to maintain that 
but evolve and keep going with the times and be applicable in a modern day as well. So I'm sure it's going to keep growing for sure, definitely. Well, you're absolutely right. You know, there's the ancient ways of uh, uh, two hits um, and not so much takedowns because, um, you know, you're on the battlefield. So you think of all these warriors just flying down and raising havoc. But, um, and then remind me to tell you about uh, 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 one more thing. Um, I. I think, you know, I was very blessed to have my teacher who evolved the art to modern Lua. So we have the aspects of the ancient, the Maoli, but we also have the modern. And I make a joke that we're kind of, uh, Kai Balu is kind of the Cobra Kai of the Lua group, you know, because he would always scream, finish it, you know, <laughs> so take them down, you know. And so I, I joke, but it's kind of true, you know. Um, Formidable for sure. All of the practitioners that were first generation under Alohi Solomon Kaiva are a little bit, we're all kind of a little bit nuts. <laughs> but speaking of the battlefield, this would be carried by the um the, uh, the older warriors um that would use this to uh, finish off any of the other warriors that were still on the battlefield as the other warriors have already progressed. So this was lighter. Um, they could carry it longer distances and they would use it to um, clean up, if you will, uh, at the back side of the battlefield. So I know you enjoyed this weapon, so I thought I'd give you a little more history on that. So. Yeah, thank you. That definitely is something that I'm going to try and make myself. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> because that, that's something that, because from Wing Chun, we have them short range bam strikes. That's something that would be quite useful. <laughs> Pretty, very much. Yeah, I would love, I'd love to actually um, make this out of metal and to have the shark teeth actually cut out of metal. You think, you know, metal was introduced by the visitors and from there, all of our indigenous weaponry kind of, you know, went underground and everything became about cannons and bayonets and things of that nature. So it would be really shocking and probably blasphemy to some if we, if I could make a set out of steel, it would be really quite shocking to see. Um, but I've had several dreams about it. So maybe in the future. <laughs> I could see that in a movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, gosh, like a vampire movie, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Vampire. Vampire's pretty cool. I, um, zombies, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so much history in, uh, to the art of Lua. I hope that at some point you get to make some sort of documentary about it as well, to be honest. Wow. Really um, put it all together. I... There's so much there. Uh, there's a lot of history. Um, there's some artifacts at Bishop Museum. There's more artifacts of the weapons and other Hawaiian items, especially there in the UK, believe it or not. That's the number mm -hmm. one place, I think, for a concentration of um, Polynesian and South and uh, Hawaiian items. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we'd ever make a documentary. There's those back home that um, probably wouldn't want to do that. There is a group, Immersion Labs, that try to archive specific cultural arts, martial arts, specifically warrior arts. And I'm not sure if we'll ever get, we'll ever be able to get that done. Um, it's, Lua is held very closely to the chest, especially back home. And um, very few are even accepted to train. And you're, you're not accepted to train unless you have some Hawaiian blood. So you know, me being able to be on the mainland, of course, frequently going back to work with some truly amazing elders of different lineages. Um, I'm able to, I'm able, like my teacher, to train those that don't have any Hawaiian blood. They're remarkable spirits. There's no appropriation. It's enriching their life, these deeper principles, and no one owns these. No one. So why not share them? Um, I think we would, I would be shocked and others would be shocked to find that these very same principles or slightly varied are just called different things in different indigenous cultures. So um, my students are truly amazing and I, I'm not gonna decline them because they don't have any Hawaiian blood. It's their perseverance, their character, their determination and their thirstiness to learn and to advance. Um, that is why I teach them their loyalty to their self evolution. Um, and they are respectful and they want to learn more and it's hard to keep up with them and their requests. Kumu, books on this. Kumu, can I have a glossary on this? Kumu, what does this mean? And I love it. So um, yeah, keep it coming. It, it helps me know um, what they need to be successful um, and as they advance as, as human beings, regardless of gender. So I will continue to teach them as long as they'll have me. Hmm. Amazing, 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 Michelle. 
Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here to hear about your journey, Lua, to see the weapons, which is always awesome, and to hear about your projects that you've got coming up as well. So I'm going to put the links to everything in the description. And is there anything else you'd like to add? Any places people can reach you, other places or any updates on your movie? Where should they go to find out about that? Well, there's an our culture uh, Instagram uh, user, I think, a handle. So um, I think it's going to explode once there's more uh, press releases on who's joined. Um, but I can be found at Michelle Manu on both Facebook and Instagram uh, and Twitter. Uh, I think Kumu's thrown in there somewhere, but you'll be able to find it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's quite a bit on YouTube if you'd like to see some videos at different locations. Um, and uh, nakoa.thinkific.com is where the classroom is. If you wanted to take a look at, um, there's some beginning paperwork there, some information on the system, uh, what's tolerated, what's not. Uh, you know, you always gotta make that clear. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I just write to me or, or find me and, and I'll try to share as much as I can. And, and thank you, Luca, for your time and for honoring the Hawaiian people and the Kaivalu lineage of Lua and Lua as the whole, and maybe I'll even throw in woman martial artists. <laughs> Thank you for having me today. I'm really grateful. Oh, my actual pleasure. And it's been a yeah, great, really great time. And I hope to uh, speak with you and carry on staying in contact with you. And yes, please. Looking forward to seeing, seeing the movie as well. So. <sighs> And let me know if I can ever serve you in any way. Maybe I can stop through the UK on my way to Zurich next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be so awesome. Would love that. Would love that. Be great. Okay, well, thank, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you.